Hello, I'm Heather Sebo. In this short video, I hope to give you a taste of our marvellous journey in Greece, the ASA Homer Tour. Our travels, of course, take us through all the dynamism and diversity of modern Greece. But what makes our journey so distinctive, so unforgettable, is that it also takes us to the real world of the poet we call Homer, the poet of the Odyssey. We visit places that Homer names and that were already mythic in his lifetime. And we follow Homer's stories about the hero Odysseus and his difficult homecoming from the Trojan War. Homer's stories are the path we tread and the thread that ties it all together. So we'll set out one bright autumn morning from the beautiful harbour town of Hania on Crete. We know that Homer's name for Hania is Kydonia. And as we travel over land and sea, it will be my pleasure to tell you Homer's names, as I've just done, and what he says, and the stories he tells about the places we pass through. Our first city after Hania is Heraklion, another beautiful port city. And in Heraklion, we visit the Archaeological Museum. I think it's one of the world's great museums. The place is stuffed with treasures. One unforgettable object is the Phaestus disc. As you see on the slide, it's a clay disc covered in mysterious signs. And these signs have not yet been translated, although many have tried. At the archaeological site of Phaestus, I'll show you where the disc was found. We also visit the palatial site of Knossos, and we'll see that the layout is similar to Phaestus except that at Knossos, the original archaeology has been overlaid with the British Sir Arthur Evans's controversial early 20th century reconstructions. Homer mentions Knossos often. It was already a mythical place in his time. He says that at Knossos, King Minos conversed with the god Zeus, and that it was here that the craftsman Daedalus built a dancing floor for the princess Ariadne. I'm sure Homer also knew the story that Daedalus built a labyrinth at Knossos to hold the Minotaur, the monstrous man-bull, and about how he and his son Icarus escaped from Knossos on wings made of feathers held together with wax. Sadly, Icarus flew too close to the sun, the wax melted, the wings fell to pieces, and the boy drowned in the sea. We cross the Sea of Crete on a high-speed catamaran to the volcanic island of Santorini. Some of us have walked to the smoking volcanic centre of the caldera on a path so hot you could fry an egg, but that's not compulsory. On Santorini, we visit Akrotiri, a Bronze Age town that was buried in metres of rock and ash sometime around 1600 BC, in what might have been the world's largest volcanic eruption. Akrotiri is a Greek Pompeii. And as at Pompeii, the eruption that devastated the city and blotted out the sun saved it for us. The excavations that have been going on since 1967 have revealed a prosperous settlement of multi-storied buildings with complex plumbing and drainage systems and sewerage. And as you walk along the excavated streets, you get a sense of the busy, sophisticated life that was lived there. No human remains have been discovered at Akrotiri, and apart from pottery and furniture, no objects made of precious material have been found, except a small, perfect, golden ibex. The ibex was found just where you see the arrow on the slide. It seems that the inhabitants got away with their valuables, but archaeologists think that the little ibex might have been left as a gift to placate the gods. Our tour has often been in the right place at the right time, and we will be again this year because the Greek Ministry of Culture recently inaugurated a permanent exhibition of 57 frescoes, wall paintings, discovered at Akrotiri. A few of these have been on display before, but most have never been seen. Now at last, they are all exhibited together 
in a setting that reproduces their original context only a few kilometres from where they were found. They're just waiting for us. The fortress at Mycenae is a rugged and forbidding place. And the main entrance is through the massive Lion Gate. Almost the entire circuit of defensive walls still stands and they are so formidable that the ancients thought only a giant race of cyclops could have built them. On day nine, after a feast fit for the gods, one of many, we visit the splendid museum and archaeological site of Olympia. It's a place whose deep history is lost in the mists of time. But we know that sports in the Bronze Age were associated with funeral games, as if the spectacle of the human body at the height of performance and beauty was an assertion of life over death. The athletic contests that are the basis of our modern Olympics were established in about 776 BC, in Homer's lifetime, and Olympia became a rich and brilliant sanctuary dedicated to the god Zeus. And yes, Zeus survived from the Bronze Age and he's not the only god who did. The Greeks were so enthralled by the exhilaration of athletic prowess, they felt it must delight the gods as well. What you see on the slide are the ruins of what was once Zeus's great temple at Olympia. The games in his honour took place every four years. Calendars and treaties were dated from one Olympiad to the next, and even wars had to cease for their duration. At last we cross the deep blue Ionian Sea to Ithaca, to the longed-for homeland that haunted Odysseus's dreams. And what a boat ride it is, because for us too, it is a kind of homecoming. After all, as the poet Kefafi said, Ithaca gave us the marvellous journey. And early next morning, we set off up the slopes of Homer's Mount Neritos. After lunch, we go on a walk that is also a pilgrimage to the very heart of the island, to a unique place that matches Homer's description of the layout and location of Odysseus's palace. On one of our tours, Barry described the beginning of our walk like this. Off the village path one pace, we stepped into an unknown place, down a goat path made of stone, well outside our comfort zone, searching for your citadel, your stronghold here in Ithaca. Was it real or mythic? Ah, no one now can tell. Ithaca is our special place, but I'm always glad that Ithaca is not the end, that there's further to go and more discoveries to make. After all, as Homer said, there will always be another journey. But I'll finish with our boat ride and picnic on the banks of the Acheron River. Homer says that the Acheron is one of the underworld rivers of Hades. He says that Periphlegathon, the river of fire, and Cocytus, the river of wailing, flow into the Acheron. But the Acheron is achingly beautiful. You can see why the ancients would have thought it was a river of Hades, because it bursts straight up out of the soil beneath our feet, fed by countless miraculous crystal springs. Even Acheron is not quite the end, but that is perhaps enough for now.